And um, this is where a stacked bar chart is actually useful, right? We can see two trends here. Um, you know, this is uh, stacked bars that are unhelpful, um, intentionally so, I would say. Um, but let's look at this. Okay, the first year is 1983, and we'll talk about 1983. I mentioned 1983 because that's the year that the Medicare hospice benefit took effect when the money became available. And we can see that uh, the not-for-profit, the gold part of the bar, the, the bottom of the bar, peaked around 1998. So let's mark it and um, just project, see what the trajectory is. In 1983, the first year of Medicare hospice benefit, money available to pay for Medicare beneficiaries to be on hospice, there were about 36 not-for-profit hospice organizations around the country. And uh, that trended upward for the next 15 years and hit a peak of about 1,400 in 1998. And then since then, it's kind of drifted downward slowly um, so that in the next 16 years, uh, it went from about 1,400 to 1,280 plus minus. All right. Let's look at the for-profit sector now. In 1983, there were about four of them. They were really just a handful. Uh, the source that I used said less than 10% uh, of the 40 hospices in existence. So that's where I got that figure. All right. And again, why 1983? Well, the convergence of clinical thought about pain control with a philosophy of humane palliative care for the dying occurred during the 1960s. And it was driven by or highlighted by or exemplified by the work of Dame Cicely Saunders at St. Christopher's Hospice in 1967. And here in the U.S. with uh, Elizabeth Kubler, Dr. Elizabeth Kubler-Ross's book, on death and dying. That informed discussions over the next 10 or 15 years, um, culminating in some ways with um, the Medicare hospice benefit, which was included as part of uh, the Tax Equity and Fiscal Re Responsibility Act of 1982, or TEFRA, which um, Ronald Reagan signed. So, Looking at the trajectories of for-profit hospice um, with the spark of now there's money, um, five years later, five, in five years they went from a handful to 200, five years they doubled, five years they roughly doubled again, and really never looked back. Um, in 2014 there were 2,420 of them, and now we're up to 3,600 plus minus of them, right? So look at these two trajectories. And got to wonder, how did for-profit hospice even begin? Well, you got to go back to before 1977. And here's one little thread that I found. Um, down in Miami, there were two people, uh, Minister Reverend Hugh Westbrook and a nurse, Esther Cauliflower. And uh, they got together and established the Hospice of Miami as a not-for-profit, all-volunteer uh, entity. And it really grew out of classes and discussions <laughs> and group meetings at uh, one or more community colleges or other locations, but I know there was a community college involved, where they talked about how can we do this, okay? They were inspired by Kubler-Ross and Dame and Cecily Saunders, right? So that's in 1977. And there's more to their story. Um, it's worth exploring. I don't do it here. So go forward a year. And Reverend Westbrook was actually joined by this guy, Don Gates. Don Gates was a hospital administrator, but so he was a hospital guy, hospital operations guy, and he saw this hospice thing, and so he joined them. And um, it became Hospice Care Incorporated. They began expanding. They established uh, several offices in the Chicago area, um, also other locations in Florida outside of Miami, and also reaching out into Texas, uh, Dallas, Fort Worth, and then uh, in Houston. So they're establishing these other care centers um, under the name of Hospice Care Incorporated in other states. Uh, Don Gates in particular becomes very active in lobbying the Florida legislature uh, regarding licensing. And in fact, Florida implemented the first licensing regulations for hospice um, 
and this guy was in on the ground floor with what those regulations were. Um, and also participated in active ongoing lobbying uh, in Congress, um, specifically for uh, money from Medicare for hospice. So 1983, five years later, you know, through TEFRA, that becomes a reality. In 1984, Hospice Care Incorporated changes its charter and becomes a for-profit uh, business. Uh, about eight years, so they operate that way and they expand that way and um, build their business. In 1992, they changed the name from Hospice Care Inc., not very imaginative, to Vitas, um, probably engaged some brand experts to come up with that. Um, and in 2004, um, sold the whole kit and caboodle for $406 million dollars to the ChemEd Corporation, traded on the NASDAQ, on the New York Stock Exchange uh, under the symbol CHE. All right, 406 million. So um, ChemEd Corporation, uh, here's where they're picking up Vitas, and as you can see, their stock price was pretty, um, you know, nothing much happening. But wow. What a purchase since then, right? I mean, they're currently trading at, you know, over 500, I would say. I, certainly as of, uh, yeah, all right? So they've been, they've been riding at this level for a while with some ups and downs. Now, ChemEd Corporation is a holding company. They have two divisions. Vitas is one division, and their other division is Roto-Rooter. Boy, they have been on a tear, haven't they? Um, you know, I got this picture of uh, Don Gates from the Tampa Bay Times and a story that popped up that a um, lawsuit accuses Senate President Don Gates. So he went from running a hospice and selling a hospice to um, being actively involved in Florida politics as um, an elected official. Now president, or as of 2013, president of um, the Florida Senate. And, you know, this is the result of a, of a whistleblower suit that um, his company was engaged in fraud for more than 11 years, including um, the time during the time that Gates was vice chairman. Now, again, he sold it um, and said, hey, I, I took the money and walked away. So I got nothing to do with what Vetus has been doing since then. Um, but. He was there in 2002, in 2003, in 2004, and they were the largest for-profit hospice in the country. And what they did, essentially, was they billed for a, a level of crisis care, hospice crisis care, like intensive care, uh, as opposed to the routine level of care. And they billed for these services, whether or not they were provided or whether or not they were really needed that that higher level of care, that that more expensive level of care. And it's the difference between these days, the difference between, I'll say, $200 Medicare reimbursement for a, root, a day of routine level of care to well over $1,000, probably on its way to $2,000 um, for this kind of crisis care, right? Several times. And that not only did they do this, but they did it because it was marketing driven, it was sales driven, that they needed to drive the number of claims. And they had targets to meet, goals for the number of days that were to be billed. All right. So a few years later, they settled, which often happens, um, and paid $75 million to uh, resolve the case. Oh, just in case um, you were wondering about um, this guy named uh, Don Gates is, uh, yeah, that's his son. 